On this episode, we discuss how technology has allowed for some extensive work from home arrangements, The Witcher getting a sequel, and the new Mars rover is a go for launch. We'll also talk about the next SpaceX crewed launch, and I am desperate for a rumor to be true. Plus, Chris loops us into all the latest Xbox goodness. This and more in this week's show. I'm Anthony Bachman from All Things Good and Nerdy, a geeky podcast, part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other fantastic geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. This is the official GunnaGeek.com show. Each week, we run down the latest news and happenings in the world of geek. These are your hosts for the show, Steven, Chris, and SP. Welcome to the 340th episode of the official GunnaGeek.com show. I don't know why I'm besides that. I'm Stephen John Drew, and I'm pleased to say Chris is here this week. Howdy, folks. And you know who else is here? Pioneer, comma, Stargate. Please call me SP. It's great to be back on the Gunny Geek show for another week of some fun news and a great segment. I can't wait to talk about the subjects that we're going to talk about this week. Fun fact, there's a good chance if you're watching the video side of things, you will get a crotch shot at some point tonight because uh, SP sent me a video earlier today that was uh, was down from the top down and you could see his, his crotchal region. He had pants on allegedly, but I don't know. Jury's out on that. Also, I really hurt my lower back over the weekend, so there's a good chance at some point I'll just have to stand up. And what's going to happen if I stand up? You're going to get the crotch shot. Well, this was a fun show. Thanks for having me. I'll see you all next week. (laughs) You know, I once podcasted with a co-host who literally had to belt himself into a chair because his back was thrown out. So are you saying that I should belt myself? Are you saying that you want to belt me, SB? Because I have had many dreams of you belting me. I'm guessing either your sons or your spouse or maybe all of them would like to do that. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I had a podcast host that had to podcast laying on his couch because he was having knee issues this week and couldn't move. So that was fun for him. Was that Willie? But, yeah. I don't, he no, didn't laying show, on his couch, though. It, he didn't show any video. I yes, know. that was on purpose because he couldn't really position his camera very well. I think that he wasn't showing his video because he wasn't on his couch. Oh, he was on his couch. (laughs) He just might have not been wearing much on his couch. Get that image out of your head. Oh, God. That's worse than the image I gave at the top of the show. (laughs) It's a furry sweater, my friends. It's a furry sweater. All things good and nerdy. Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Eastern. You can find it at geeks.live. We did have a fun guest host this week. A sailor Poland from our chat room joined us to talk about the Star Trek Comic Con. Which he was entirely wrong on by the way let's just go ahead and get that out there right <laughs> is now is this sleeve gate 2020 we're gonna have right <laughs> well, now just, Steven? He, he commented about how sleeves the the um the animated series that's upcoming lower decks uh, they had rolled up sleeves in it and he criticized that he's like when have there ever been rolled up sleeves in star trek and it's like well o'brien Chief had o'brien him. Yeah. o'brien had him but i'm pretty sure it's also as i was sitting there thinking about it i'm pretty sure they did it like in every movie in fact i think Worf even rolls up his sleeves at one point I don't remember that much. (laughs) It doesn't matter that much to me. The point he was making, I understood. And well, it's neither here nor there. If you want to hear what Sailor Poland thought about the upcoming Star Trek Lower Decks, spoiler alert, he didn't care for it. You can listen to the latest (laughs) episode of All Things Good and Nerdy. Did you just ruin your own tease by by giving away what happened? There's a lot more to it than him just saying he didn't care for it. Believe you me. (laughs) At this point, if you just want to say, listener, if you want to disagree with it, go to youtube.com slash gonna geek go to the episode of all things good and nerdy and leave a comment on why sailor paul was wrong do you call him sailor paul is that what you called him i like that i did (laughs) i like that all right so check out sailor paul on the all things good and nerdy podcast and while you're over there say hello to will nelson as well let's go willie to nelson (laughs) let's go ahead and move on to the news
All right, this first news article, if you didn't know this, there is a upcoming Star Trek series called The Lower Deck. No, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> no, we're talking about it all. Uh, well, I'm actually talking about something that we, I don't know that we've really, like, commented on the impact, aside from a couple, the you know, like, dates with ships and stuff launching, the impact on... Um, coronavirus with the tech world recently. I, I think it's been a while since we've talked about anything that's directly an impact behind but, uh, because of COVID. And today we got a news all about Google's impact from COVID-19. If you didn't know this, in July of 2020, a lot of people are working at home right now because of COVID. I know Chris Farrell is. I know I am. Uh, there's lots of people who are working at home. And today, the news came out that Google has announced that they will be having their employees work from home till at least July 2021. This is what a company spokesperson said today. Now, the company had previously announced that employees would be re working remotely until the end of 2020, but now they are saying that they're going to extend that till at least July 2021. There wasn't a lot of details on why this was determined, but this was something that was announced. And the reason I wanted to bring it up was twofold. Number one, we've seen a lot of companies hide behind the fact that they're working at home and there's delays. And I think Google has even been one of them. However, they're, they have announced it's going to go until 2021. But the second reason I want to bring it up is just to talk a little bit about how technology is allowing this. This would have been unheard of like five years ago. And look at what we've got now. So the real reason that Google is allowing its employees to work from home is, you know, how many servers that Google has to keep up with YouTube and Gmail and stuff like that. It takes a lot of power and they just don't want to pay that power bill for their employees in the office building. So they kind of shut the power down. They didn't pay their power bill and they have to have their employees work from home because they're not paying for the power. Uh, I was thinking that Chris has registered so many domains that they don't know how to manage that. And so what's happening is they actually wow. have to send people home so that somehow they save dollars. I don't know. Steven, I wager you have more domains squirreled away than I do right now. <laughs> I've let a lot of mine go. <laughs> maybe, maybe. In all honesty, though, I, I was joking there. The ability for American companies to send workforces home, and not only that, but to hire, retain, retire, you know, go through that whole cycle with employees from a remote working location is amazing. And I think it's going to really revamp the way that companies act in the future as far as working from home and not. And there's been a lot of speculation on workers wanting to leave high cost areas like San Francisco and go somewhere that is not as expensive to live, whether that's in the Midwest or in the uh, Southwest, that's not Arizona and, and the high population areas. But it is amazing what they're thinking of. Not only that, but the workplace of the future is being designed during this pandemic as well. You have office places like Steelcase, Herman Miller, or whatever, that have designed the open office place which has been a staple over the last 10, 15 years. And the results are in, and it's not really working. So they're like, okay, how can we design the workplace of the future? So they're looking into that. They're looking into the restrooms of the future. I've had the opportunity to research a little bit into that myself. My best thing that I could tell you, if you want to learn about how these companies are preparing themselves for the future, not only the companies themselves like Google, but the office place providers, infrastructure providers, is, uh, believe it or not, CBS Sunday Morning has had a couple of great segments. You can find them on YouTube underneath the YouTube channel, CBS Sunday Morning. Last week, they had a great one, or maybe it was two weeks ago, they had a great one about the workplace of the future, which encompasses a lot of the things that I've been researching. And then this week, they had something about the restroom of the future for the America, but it will also affect everywhere else, which includes sink fixtures that are completely redesigned, toilet fixtures that are completely redesigned, stalls that are completely redesigned, and more of a European model, but it's designed even further from European 
So it's not just working from home that's being changed here. It's the entire workplace of the modern American or North American company that is being redesigned during this time period. As long as they don't start going after those toilets that are designed to reduce poo time because like they angle them this way so that you won't want to sit on the toilet for long. Those are the devil. Anyone who puts those in is wrong. I uh, personally felt that I needed to install it, so I installed it in my own house. So you could just slide off when you're done? Yeah, you know, it was either that or the toilet cam, and so I decided to go with that one. Do you use a squatty potty with it, Stephen? I do, I do, and also... Um, so you can kind of perch then and hold yourself in place so you can yes, sit there for a while. Absolutely. As, by Ooh. the way, for the audio listener, SP is giving us a look of confusion about the squatty potty. Are you not familiar with the squatty potty? I am not. Okay, so the Squatty oh. Potty. Here, let's do a little education here. This is so, a legitimate product, by it, the way, guys. It is. And the Squatty Potty, the idea is it's a stool that is meant to elevate your feet because the theory being, if you think about back to how we evolved, at some oh. point we didn't have a toilet, therefore we probably squatted down. So in theory, the body is made, made to basically do its business in a squatting type motion. And there's been studies and things like that. And apparently this helps that situation some so people say, swear by them if your toilet's backed up or maybe you know you've had a little bit too much adult beverages or whatever you could go into your backyard and squat and do your business there no no D different kind no this this is something you use with a regular toilet so that yeah you're... but i right but you can get the same effect either way oh i see what you're saying yes absolutely you could in fact i do every day <laughs> There's your, another visual for you. Uh, but anyways, I thought this was worth bringing up, not the Squatty Potty, but worth bringing up the Google thing, because you're right. I think you nailed it. The the uh, office of tomorrow is today. Uh, that Trademark that immediately. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's talk a little bit about Witcher. I heard that Chris Farrell is a witch and he is going to tell us all about how he is witchier than ever. I heard you should toss a coin to your Witcher. Did anyone, no one else get the song? No, there? didn't get it. I've heard the references, but I have not watched The Witcher yet. <sighs> am I supposed, so, to, am I supposed uh, to understand that? If you've watched The Witcher or were familiar with internet culture for a while there, it was pretty popular, the whole toss a coin to your Witcher song. Internet culture? Me? No. Mm, that's fair. <laughs> so for those that aren't aware, The Witcher is a very popular Netflix series, also a video game series that was originally a book series. It's also incredibly popular. Netflix just announced that The Witcher will be getting a six-part limited series called The Witcher Blood Origin. It will be their very first story of this kind. According to an emailed release, this will take place 1,200 years before the events of Henry Cavill's Netflix series. It will be set in the elven world that's largely been lost to history. Blood Origins will focus on the events that led to the worlds of humans, elves, and monsters coming together in what in the books is called The Conjunction of the Spheres. In regards to the show, The Witcher writer Declan DeBarra will serve as showrunner for the series, with The Witcher showrunner Lauren Schmidt Hisrich coming on board as executive producer. And I apologize here, I'm going to butcher a Polish name here because I don't know the pronunciation very well. I did look it up online. But series author Andrzej Sapowski, who has written the entire line of Witcher books, will serve as creative consultant for this prequel series. So why is this important? Well, Netflix has claimed that the Henry Cavill-led Witcher series is one of its most watched shows. So it makes sense that the Witcher blood origin is not the only Witcher spinoff that might be in the works. That's right. This is the first of many. There's also The Witcher Nightmare of the Wolf, an anime that will tell the story of Geralt's mentor, Vesemir. The second series of The Witcher is also getting ready to resume production soon. We don't know exactly when. It's all on pause due to the novel coronavirus pandemic. There's also... No poster release date for Blood Origin, nor the Nightmare of the Wolf anime, or any of these things. But Netflix going all in on The Witcher, which is arguably probably a good stance to take because that's a series that pulled people in like myself who normally don't care about fantasy shows. I'm normally like, I don't care that much. Witcher series? I cared. I enjoyed it a lot. I thought Henry Cavill was really good in the role. Now, granted, I am a fan of Henry Cavill in most roles he does. Even the Superman movies I don't particularly care for. He is really good in them. So I'm excited to see where they go with this. And, you know, as all of this gets announced, it makes me go, I might actually have to dip my toes in the waters of reading some of these Witcher books, which is tough for me to do because most fantasy books I don't care for because I like my fantasy to be set in space. I'm sorry to tell you, but they screwed up. 
they completely screwed up with this, Chris Farrell. Because they didn't cast you? No, because this is a prequel to The Rit- the Witcher. So it should have been called The Witch. And then obviously, then the next thing in the storyline would be The Witcher. And then the sequel after that could be The Witchest. So they've just screwed up the naming altogether. Yes, I'm sure the author's intent of how this should be named is totally wrong in his own uh, universe that he's created. Sorry, they, they messed up. It is uh, an obvious natural conclusion is the witch to the witcher to the witchest. So you're saying the Star Wars trilogy should have been Star Wars, Star Warser, and Star Warsiest? Well, the question is, <laughs> which version of the Star Warsiest is the one that matters? Is it like... Do we have to evolve it every time uh, Lucas touched it? So then it's like the Star Warsiest take two. Like, how would the naming convention work? What <laughs> Star Warsiest? <laughs> that, uh, right. you, you're not on board with that Stargate Pioneer. <laughs> I just find that type of English uniquely mine, and was wondering why you started using it. <laughs> Trademark infringement. <laughs> For those that don't know, by the way, I'm excited about this just because of the producer here. Laura Schmidt has Hensrich, Histrich, I think is her name. I've covered her before. I've covered her on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. when she was doing Daredevil and the Defenders. Prior to that, she worked on the West Wing. She also did private practice, uh, the Umbrella Academy. She is amazing. So anything that she is involved with. I know is going to be good and worthy of me watching. I just haven't had time to watch it yet. It's good. It's a little trippy because they play around with the timeline of things. Once you figure out how they're doing that, it all makes sense. And they did say season two would not play around with the timeline. Any, a lot of shows do that. West wing, not West wing, uh, West world also mm-hmm. did a timeline frack in their first season. It, yeah. It what just, you don't, what you don't realize in season one of the Witcher is the stories told about three main characters, but their storylines don't sync up to being at the same time until near the end of the series. So in the beginning, you might be watching an episode about Geralt that is set 40 years prior to the current day events. Meanwhile, when it fl- flips over to the character Siri, that might be sent in current day events. It-, it takes a minute before you realize, oh, wait, these guys are all in different time periods, potentially, until it all comes together at the end. It's really good. Just... I can understand how some people got confused at first because it's like, what the hell's going on? Last week, Geralt was here. This week, he's in this land and he doesn't know this character he was just talking to last week. What, what the hell? It, it's okay. You'll figure it out. It's fun. It's a fun watch. I promise. I usually love that type of storytelling. I, and honestly, I do. And I'll probably love this too. The one show that I've watched, which you would have thought that I would have just loved to no end, but I got confused even to this day, was Dunkirk. Because the way that story was told was a little bit too much for me to mm. understand how the timeline worked while I was watching it. And I think it just ruined it for me because I was trying to figure it out the whole time, even though I knew going in kind of what they were doing. So if it's not that where you have time frames that are moving at different times, you know, different speeds, basically, I think I'll be fine with this. Side note, Henry Cavill who we talked about last week in our post show as he was building a PC. He's the lead in this show and he is fantastic. And you don't realize how good an actor can be until they're acting with using no words and you get what totally what they're saying. Because if you've read the books or played the video games, Geralt is notorious for random and all sorts of different grunts and noises. But the way Cavill does it with his body positioning and look on his face, you totally understand when like he's giving an exasperated grunt or a pissed off grunt or something like that. And it totally works. And it sounds really weird to talk about the fact that a dude is such a good actor in regards to grunting. Well, I am going to have to check this out. I have not checked it out yet. And uh, you told me that I could find this on CBS All Access, correct? No, that's where Star Trek Lower Decks will be. Oh. This is on Netflix. Oh, we're not talking about Lower Decks. Henry Cavill's not in Lower Decks? As far as I know, Henry Cavill is not. Henry Cavill, if you want to see him streaming, will be on HBO Max with the Justice League Snyder Cut movie, which I can go on a diatribe about if you really want me to, but I don't think anybody wants When does that, that come out? I'm curious. <laughs> Nobody knows. Sometime in 2021, supposedly. Oh. I am Groot. You know, we are Groot. <laughs> 
it's it's funny because right now networks are hurting for content and something like that would be perfect to drop right now but they're not yeah. they weren't ready for it so yeah they're not ready they're going to spend 20 30 million dollars on special effects and refilming some stuff i guess to try and put it out there and so i guess stupid. Zack snyder said he wouldn't keep anything that joss whedon did and he used some profanity to explain why he wouldn't so really? there's all sorts of scandal and people on twitter are all a buzz about Zack Snyder's comments, and I continue to say Zack Snyder makes pretty movies, but not good movies, and I stand by that. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Well, moving on to the next news story, uh, I'll introduce it with a uh, a lyric. Uh, they see me roving the surface, patrolling, and now it's getting dirty. Go ahead. I have no idea what that was from, but I again think it's from sort of pop culture or internet culture. <laughs> That I am not aware of. Chris got the reference. I did. I did not get that reference. <laughs> they see me roving. Sorry, continue. <laughs> what I want to talk about today is hopefully by the time this podcast gets posted has already happened. And that is NASA's Mars 2020 rover Perseverance. Perseverance is a go for launch. We finally got the, the final go ahead. Remember, it's been delayed. And remember, there's a launch window that comes around every 26 months and it only lasts so long. If you don't meet that window, you're going to sit for 26 months until the next window is open. So this is by a bunch of articles. There's a couple of articles on space.com by Mike Wall. There's an article on Space Flight Now by Stephen Clark. And it was all about the fact that this morning, as we were recording on Monday, July 27th, 2020, the $2.7 billion Mars 2020 Perseverance rover passed its launch readiness review, which is the last big hurdle to clear before its planned liftoff on Thursday, July 30th from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station or Kennedy Space Station, you know, whatever you want to call it. It's down there in Florida. So it's scheduled to lift off atop the United Launch Alliance Atlas V, also known as an Atlas V rocket, Thursday during a two-hour window that opens at 7.50 a.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, or if you're worldwide savvy, 11.50 GMT. And guess what? The weather window looks good. There's just a 20% chance that bad weather will scuttle Thursday's attempt also known as just scrubbing. And if everything goes well, Perseverance will land on Mars February 18th, 2021. Okay, so how many days is this behind the other rover that just recently launched? A few days. I've, I didn't know how much, but it's been a couple of weeks. It'll be about three weeks in between the launches. Because I heard that there's a whole bunch of rovers that are on their way up right now. Is that true? There's three that were launched there was the uae launched one and that was uh, the japan and esa is launching one and so are we and when does uh sp's personal homemade drone launch i heard that you were going to launch one yourself <laughs> we're not Suncast. To talk about that one uh, i thought that you were going to use the equipment that mad mike was <laughs> left behind yeah. A steam rocket? Yeah. Uh, that, no, that was donated to the cause of the flat earthers. Ah, fair enough. Well, I look forward to the day that you launch your drone onto this flat earth, off of this flat earth. Again, what makes this probe, this launch, so unique is this will be the first helicopter on Mars. Now, Perseverance is a rover, but there's going to be a helicopter that goes along Mars 2020, as well as an orbiter that goes around Mars as well. So the thing is. You got a rover, you got a helicopter, you got a orbiter or a probe or a satellite, whatever you want to call it. It's going to, if this works, let me foot stomp that a little <laughs> bit. If this works, if this launches just fine on Thursday, they're going to be hauling the mail to Mars and we're going to have a new rover out there. And hopefully we won't bomb Mars again. We've been known to do that in the past. I just, I hope we don't do that. this time. We're trying to find where Suncast is holed up. That's why we keep bombing it. Yeah. This is the one, though, that I, I was talking about a while back about it basically being a drone, right? Wasn't that what or was that? A yeah, the helicopter yeah. is a drone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Which is su super fun because obviously that's the plot of every like alien movie that ever came to be is, you know, something flying 
has got a live feed, and then all of a sudden it goes black because why did it go black? We don't know. And then it turns out the aliens were sitting there shooting it down. Yeah, you never know. Uh, you could be taking pictures of MU69 where life began. You don't know. But Chris, I have to ask Chris, Chris, have you ever actually flown a drone? Um, no. Okay, so quadcopter is predominantly what we're talking about here. Steven and I are registered drone pilots. Oh, I'm aware. And <laughs> the thing I want to bring up, and we've talked about it before on the show, is how many times have you tried to land your drone, Steven? And you you run into an issue where it doesn't land like flat, like it turns over or something like that. Has that ever happened to you? Uh, I'll let you know when I successfully land my drone. I just keep having to buy new ones. <laughs> so, <I see. laughs> or you could go into something that's flying in the air mm -hmm. and cause it to tumble down or, or whatever. Now, this drone, I think, has some self-writing issues with okay. it, this helicopter. But just imagine that, like, you're on your first flight and you bring it down and it, like, springs and it bounces or whatever. And it ends up upside down and you've got one flight and that was it. This is a question that's probably going to sound absurd, but it's actually legitimate. And, and I'm sorry if I sound really stupid by asking this, but, like, how much do we know about, like, flying on another planet? Like, are, are there conditions... Like, if we're using a drone, a helicopter on Mars, are there external conditions that we might not know about um, that could cause it to fly completely differently than we had thought it would? Or do we have enough, like, data to know that that's just not possible? Perhaps, but it'd be environmental, like wind. We don't know uh, how strong of wind currents because the atmosphere is a lot less dense. Right. So we might not know that. but. The models of the atmosphere are really good, and our modeling of flight characteristics is pretty good. So I think we're pretty safe that this thing's actually going to fly. The atmosphere is less dense. It is there. We've had to use aerodynamic models to land stuff there because they parachute down. Mm -hmm. That's one of the easiest ways to get it. And then they blow up with uh, airbags, basically, and stuff has tumbled in the past until it finally rests and it just seems like the aerodynamic braking seems to be the best way to go about mars for now uh, we also do aerodynamic braking on other planets so the modeling is pretty good there i think the actual flight characteristics will be okay i'm just wonder worried that we won't know exactly like the temperature because when you're talking about flight characteristics the temperature does change the atmosphere and the ability for something to fly in the atmosphere um humidity temperature uh what your altitude is which affects the density of the atmosphere the pressure of the atmosphere so there's a bunch of things if we've modeled any of that wrong or it changes like there's a front coming there's a storm coming and and this low pressure front comes through we might not have modeled that correctly so i don't know i i think we're good though do these models do a little turn on the catwalk? I don't know if this model is going with or without clothes. It could be <laughs> naked. I don't know. Ooh, oh, interesting. Uh, okay, one last question on this. Um, how do I book this Uber? This Uber. Are you talking about the rover? I'm assuming that, that if we have a helicopter drone on Mars, it's going to be part of the Uber system so that some cast can book an Uber. That'd be kind of fun seeing him hang from the bottom of it <laughs> as it's flying around. I think he'd be too heavy for it. I think any human would be too heavy for it. I mean, you can't hang from the bottom of your drone and fly it around. Says you. Yeah, I was going to say, you've not, you've not tried it, have you? I, I've de facto tried it because <laughs> I caught it when it was landing and <laughs> It tried to take off and I held on to it and it did not take me with it. But you weren't on Mars. No, I was not. See, I got you there. You did. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for letting us know all about that. Now, moving on to the extra extra, let's talk about a couple of interesting things. First off, we got the one plus buds that we theorized about last week. The, the day after, it was Tuesday, as Chris said, it was announced. And Chris Farrell was right there in the morning updating a bunch of us on the Discord, updating us on the chats that we have that the one plus buds were released. 
And Chris Farrell, he he knows how much they were. How much were they, Chris? Ended up being seventy nine ninety nine as opposed to the ninety nine ninety nine we had predicted, which is a pretty good deal. And what were some of the um, drawbacks that it had? Same like, things we talked about in the week before. What do you mean, like limited touch controls, mm-hmm. stuff like that? Yeah, it was all confirmed. Basically, what we yeah. talked about, but it's still very appealing for the price point at seventy nine bucks. That's incredible, and you can definitely afford to uh, have a few missing features compared to some of the other things. I'm still hesitant because like my use case would probably be out in the yard and in noisy environments. And a lot of the reviews that I've seen are saying that because of the lack of noise isolation, like it's all passive noise isolation, there are, you have to turn it up. Basically the volume has to get turned up. So um, that's kind of standard before earbuds and things started to get any noise isolation. But at 79 bucks, definitely am interested. I'll wait and see what happens with the reviews. And uh, may- maybe it's worth going for something a little bit higher. I look forward to Chris Farrell's review. Well, OnePlus would have to send me a review copy because oh. as I sit here with two different sets of Bluetooth earbuds here, I don't really have a use case for a third set of them that I would need to go and buy. But if they wanted to send me a review copy, I would be happy to add it to my ongoing... Jeez, review series <laughs> of Chris Farrell reviews. Uh, that was Bluetooth incredible headphones. for the audience for for the people at home. If you didn't know what that was, Chris Farrell just dropped pots and pans. He's cooking at his kitchen yeah, right now. No, exactly. no, he's actually got a storm rolling through. He was messaging us behind the scenes, saying, "Hey, I got a storm coming through, and I can hear it now." That was what you heard was a storm. So if we lose Chris partway, we'll continue on the show SPNI and we'll keep going. But yeah, he is. By the way. In his basement. That's how loud it is. Yeah, this was in the basement of my house. It's a big thunderstorm coming through. <laughs> One, I thought that was his stomach growling. <laughs> I had a big dinner. And two, does that seventy nine ninety nine include a wireless charging case for the OnePlus Buds? I know That's that was negative. something we were discussing last week. Okay. Does, it, does, it does include a case that's charging, though, doesn't it? It's just yes, not. It's, it is a charging case like everything else, and it makes use of OnePlus's. Uh, you can use a standard, regular USB C charger on it, and then OnePlus has their proprietary charging method called Dash. I think is what they call it, which just does rapid, quick charging, and these will quick charge based off of that. So, yes, you can quick charge, but there is no wireless charging. And for those that aren't familiar, OnePlus's method is really interesting. All of the power management for quick charging is done in the power supply brick not in the phone itself. So it keeps the temperature down in the phone as you quick charge. It's a pretty cool concept, but they are the only people using that technology because it's not licensed to anyone else. I, I'm still interested, but uh, I would look forward to if OnePlus would send you a review. Unless they send me a review, and then that's even better. But uh, I think yeah. you're the better target for it because you're the person who's on the fence about whether to try it. I don't know that it's exactly a fair fight, and I don't mean this to sound bad, but... We're talking about headphones. I hold up the Google Pixel Buds that have $180 price point in the Amazon Echo Buds that have, when they weren't on sale, like $140 price point, I think. So they're not exactly the same tier of product. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but OnePlus is trying to hit a different target spot than Amazon and Google and Apple's AirPods and stuff had been. Well, our I, I would still like to hear your review. I hope I hope something maybe one day happens. Uh, not that we've reached out or anything, so it is r- pretty slim chances that they they would. However, if well, they, d- they did, I would I would really like to see your review because of the fact that you have the other two. How good is your SEO and YouTube tagging when you post this for real? That might drive whether we get anything. Well, perhaps, perhaps <laughs> I set up this segment in a manner that I could extract it, that, what I knew mm. you were going to say. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, in our extra, well, actually, it's not lastly. So next in our extra, extra, we actually have a SpaceX update. What's the SpaceX update that we have there, Stargate Pioneer? Actually, we have two SpaceX updates. I realize I don't think we talked about it on the show before. The SpaceX crew that went up and is in the ISS right now, they're scheduled to come back on the 2nd of August, which is next week. They're scheduled to splash down. Apparently, the weather window is good, at least for now. So they're coming back down. And since they're down, 
we got to send another one up. So sometime in late September, they finally came out and said late September will be the next SpaceX crewed launch for astronauts aboard. I forget what they're calling it now. I don't think they're going with crewed anymore because I think finally somebody got the hint that crewed sounds like it's crude, like it's not refined. When you started using that term, I made the joke because I legitimately thought you were like saying like crude oil. Like, you know, that's what I, I thought, right? It was like, I know. And I wanted to say man, but I realized why they're tr- transitioning or why they tried to transition to crude because they just don't want to be gender specific yeah. with man. They want to go non-gender specific, but crude is like you said, like crude, like rude or something. And unrefined or or not mature or something like that so anyway the next one will go up they haven't given an exact date but sometime in late september will be the next spacex launch with astronauts on board well i um i'm looking forward to this continuing to evolve i mentioned it back when we talked about the, the last launch i think this was an important step in the world of space and space exploration i do really think that Having pro- the private sector involved is good for many, many reasons. So I'm looking forward to that. Plus, maybe one day I can buy my way off of this rock. Third uh, rock from the sun. Yeah. He wants to happen. go to the fourth and hang out with Suncast. Yeah. In his good. Mars bunker. And now for real this time, lastly in our extra extra, let's talk a little bit about something that I just desperately am hoping am, is true. The one and only John Prosner this week has come out and said that the Pixel 4a is definitely going to launch on August 3rd. Yes, Jan Prosser said, quote, earlier this month, I said the launch date was August 3rd, though Google has pushed this launch back a few times. They're far, they're too far down the marketing chain to change it at this time. And then two bullet points. Review units have been sent out. Embargo has been set. 100% 100% happening on August 3rd, end quote. So that huh. did come from John Persner, uh, which you can find on Twitter. And he's had a lot of review or um, leaks lately, some of which have come to fruition, s- several which have not. And uh, I want this to be desperately, like I'm desperate for this to be true because I'm using the Pixel 2 and my phone is so gone. So gone, like anything below 30%. And it's, it's dicey whether it's going to work. Sometimes it gets the boot loop. Sometimes it just shuts off. Like, I need this to be true. <laughs> Did Crosser happen to mention that they were in boxes ready to ship? Uh, I don't know that Ron Prosser mentioned that, but he, he he did say review units have been sent and an embargo has been set. So I, I don't know. Maybe that's what he meant by the too far down the marketing chain is that maybe they are ready to show. That, that's a good I question. Imagine- I imagine what Jake Pracer is meaning here is that if you've already sent these videos, these phones out to the YouTube reviewers and things like that, you can't really bottle it back up because when you send these review units, there's probably an explicit embargo date they have to meet. It says you can post this as of, say, August 3rd at 0900 hours Eastern time or something like that because this is the Wild West. Everyone wants to be the first that's out there. So they're all going to have it scheduled to launch at the same time. Everyone who's done a review unit. Well, I know that in, I think it was the last episode, SP was quoted as going, Crosser! He was so mad because his, his, his Crosser's previous um, leak about the Apple TV was incorrect. Uh, it has not happened yet. And so I'm hoping I don't have to do this to Lonnie here because I would hate if Lonnie Prosser was wrong. Yeah, Prosser said in his tweet 20 hours ago, whenever that was, he said... That do you care anymore or have they pushed this off too much? I will say, do I care anymore about this Twitter account because (laughs) I don't have my Apple TV sixth generation yet and it was supposedly ready to ship months ago. So as far as Trosser here goes, I don't want to put a lot of stock into it because I know that he's gotten a lot of credit for leaks, but... I still don't have my Apple TV. And until I have my Apple TV, there's a lot of things that aren't going to happen. And one of which is going to be accrediting Don Trosser here with anything that's valid. Well, we will find out whether Don Cherry was right or not. (laughs) 
let's go ahead and move on. Don't share three. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Farrell, you came to me earlier today and you said, I have an idea for a segment. And I said, go and do it. Yes, that's exactly what happened today, but it was really yesterday, I think. But yes, I do have a segment for you guys. I don't know. There's no specific segment name for it or anything. We don't have a cool bump for it. But we are coming upon the launch of all the current slate of next gen consoles. We know the PS5 and the Xbox Series X are both slated to drop sometime in holiday 2020. So we're having lots of cool press events between now and then with both companies to get an idea of what might be coming to these new consoles. Well, last week, Xbox had the games showcase, as they called it. It was their intent to show off a bunch of first party, Microsoft, mostly Microsoft Studio games that would be coming to their new next gen Xbox and some of them to the existing Xbox. So like we all know, the next gen Microsoft console, the Series X, will launch sometime this holiday season. Unlike the PS5, which has several exclusive titles, such as the new Miles Morales Spider-Man game, Microsoft is taking what seems to be a less of a hardline approach to the generational switchover. What do I mean by that? Well, for example, the tentpole title is Halo Infinite that'll be coming out on launch day with the Series X. This will be released on both Xbox One and Xbox Series X. Microsoft has a new tool they're calling the Smart Delivery System, which means if you buy Halo Infinite on the Xbox One, you don't need to rebuy it to then play that same game on the Series X. You'll already have it. Ownership of these games with Smart Delivery are tied to your Xbox slash Microsoft account, which will apply across platforms. They're also getting third-party vendors on board with their Smart Delivery process, meaning you buy the game on your original Xbox, Through smart delivery, when you go and play it on the next-gen Xbox, you'll get free visual upgrades and whatnot that puts it on par with what it would be in the next-gen equivalent. It's a pretty cool process. They are going to be using this smart delivery tool for a lot of the games they have coming out that were announced at the game showcase. And guys, I can't run through every single game that was announced at the game showcase. They had an hour-long event, and they announced probably 20-plus games, a variety of different things that were all really interesting, but... This segment cannot go long enough to talk about all of them. And to be honest, some of those games I don't actually care about. So I pulled what were some of the ones that were the most interesting to me out so that we could talk about them. And I would be lying. It's if always I said about one... you, isn't it? When it's your segment. Yes, I don't do my segment to cater to you, Stephen. I oh. do it to cater to the gamers out there, even though I'm a casual gamer. And I've realized because I don't have time to play video games as much. <laughs> But I still enjoy following all the news. I still enjoy having my own opinion on things. But the first game I want to talk about, which I already touched on a little bit, is Halo Infinite. It is a launch game. It was the first game they showed during the game showcase. And they showed eight minutes of gameplay footage. In this trailer, which was narrated by either Cortana or possibly Dr. Halsey, we see the Master Chief's armor constructed, which is a teaser that led directly to the gameplay demo. It's the same pilot that we saw teased at E3 2019 with the Master Chief crashing for an emergency landing. A group of the Covenant called the Banished have taken over a new Halo, and the heroes are trying to find a way to escape. This entirely open world that they've developed on the new Halo, they said, is twice as big as the Halos that were in the previous games. Twice as big as two Halos combined, I think they said at one point. Regardless, the world is going to be massive that they have developed for Halo Infinite. It's going to be an open world, sandbox kind of game, allowing you to explore, go find all sorts of cool extra features, do missions in whatever order you want, And they intend for this to be the platform for the next 10 years of Halo rather than sticking to numbered installments, meaning we got Halo 5 like four years ago. The sequel to Halo 5 is Halo Infinite, and any sequels to Infinite will just be expansions within that universe, it sounds like. I'm kind of okay with that, depending on how they go about doing that. Are they treating this as a living game, or are they treating this as tons of DLC packs we're going to have to buy? We don't know quite yet how that's going to work out. They did say in the event this will likely connect to Halo 5 Guardians. We just don't know how. They are trying to make Halo Infinite be a new entry point for newcomers to the series. Meanwhile, it's also supposed to kind of call back an homage to the original Halo Combat Evolve game. It looks pretty cool. I'm not sure how I feel about that model. Um, on one oh, hand, yeah. I, I, I kind of like how they're committing themselves just to one product so that that product can continue to be enhanced. On the other, I worry that it's like 
a path for laziness as far as, you know, when you release a dedicated game, you have to go all in. You have to have a, a big story for a big pack, a, a big product. Um, you have to get everything in a row so that this thing comes out and everybody is wanting it. But when it's like an add on, it's almost like, yeah, well, we, we could just we'll expand this little area or, oh, it's not a full game. So we, we don't have to put all the effort into it. That's what I'm worried about. Well, they're treating this more along the lines of some of these massive living games you've seen, like Destiny, Destiny 2, Anthem, things like that, where there's like events and things like that that go and take place alongside the campaign, and they eventually add more content that continues to build on the story and things like that. That's the whole living game model that we're seeing now. Chris, how old were you when Combat Evolved came out? I was 16, I think. Because Halo, 16. the original Xbox, came out on my 16th birthday, if I recall okay. correctly. So you are 35. much older now. You're adulting. You're married. You have little time to game, whatever. This is not meant for us. This is meant for that next generation of 16-year-olds that might have never had been able to play Halo before for whatever reason. Maybe they just didn't get into it. They didn't feel like they could jump on to the bandwagon as it's going along. If you're saying that Halo Infinite is a starting point, it's like comic books, right? There's com starting points in comic books all the time. This is a reset. It's been 20 years yeah. since Combat Evolve came out. It's and this time is, for a, a restart. And it's the second developer on Halo. Remember, uh, 343 Industries took over with Halo 4 when mm. Bungie went off to go do uh, Destiny and Destiny 2. So it's interesting to see where they go with it. Uh, the only concern, well... There's a few concerns I have, much like a lot of folks who watch the footage. It's tough to tell online with a stream that's compressed down on 1080p how the visuals actually look, but it didn't look the greatest visually wise or visual wise rather. Now, they did note that this was gameplay footage from a very early build of the game. They've made a lot of enhancements and 343 is promising that on the Series X, this will run at 4K at 60 frames per second. So it should be pretty nice looking when it's all said and done. I am curious to see where they go with it because the Halo 5 story shook a lot of things up and them saying that, yeah, it's connected, but we want this to be a new starting point makes me go, are they just going to gloss over everything that left hanging at the end of Halo 5? I don't know. Now, it's a weird nit to pick here because it's a first person shooter. So story is really not your primary concern. But from my standpoint, the story is because I've bought into this mythos over 20 years. So what you're saying is hashtag it might all be connected? Well, it is all connected. The question is, how do they fill the backstory of what happens between Halo 5 and Halo Infinite? Because there should presumably be, presumably, excuse me, be a lot that happens. Master Chief and Cortana have been the staples of the Halo uh, line for quite some time. And, and I get that people are attached to those characters. But one of my favorite characters of the Halo universe was Six. And if six could have continued beyond that game, then it would have been awesome to keep playing six for me because I didn't start with Combat Evolved when it first came out. I was much like you, Chris, as I was older and didn't get into gaming until a few years down the road from there. So six was I, you know, I played Master Chief first, but six was a character that I was into and. I won't spoil anything for those that haven't played the game, but six is unlikely to be back in the series. Microsoft ruined the name Cortana, by the way. Let's just get that out there right now. But it's gone now. Uh, is it? Is it really? Look Pretty at your much. menu. There's a little circle next to the bar. It's still there. For now. For now. For now. Let's talk some of the other stuff that came out. <laughs> Fables, obviously, at the top of not Fable, excuse me, Halo. Fables next on my list, which is why I said that. For those that aren't familiar, Fable series goes back to the original Xbox. There are open world RPGs that are known for kind of their irreverent humor and take on things. It is a game series that I've greatly enjoyed because you can try and influence people by telling them jokes, laughing with them, or the funniest thing you can eventually buy gestures allow you to burp in people's faces or fart on them to get evil points. It's kind of Sold. entertaining. I'm in. Yeah, right. <laughs> and if you have Game Pass, the first three Fable games are on there. Oh, really? You know, nothing. Yes. We know uh -huh. nothing about when Fable 4 is coming out, but it is coming back. It's being developed by Playground Games, who are the developers of Forza Horizon. Now, we didn't get much of a teaser, but it did premiere with a small fairy 
who resembled Tinkle, Tinkerbell, excuse me, who flew into the magical world, but she was then eaten by an enormous toad, which continues with the ridiculous over-the-top humor that you have and just stupid moments in Fable that kind of makes fun of fables and tall tales and things like that and builds into their world. It's a really good game. It's one that people have been clamoring to have come back at some point in time because I think Fable 3 came out in like 2010 or 2011. And it's an Xbox owned property that was kind of a big deal. And in the world of first party exclusives, a lot of people were saying, hey, this is one of your big ticket items. Why don't we have one? So it is in development. As for when it shows up, I don't know. <laughs> some, sometime. <laughs> Uh, it will presumably not be on the original Xbox One. It'll probably be Series X only, is my guess. So have they actually given anything to actually bite onto, or is this just all talk at this point? It was a teaser trailer. This is this was their one more thing at the very end of okay. the show. Okay. Now, I put it up near the top because it's one of the things that mostly excited me. But as they were wrapping up the show, they said, hey, and one more thing, a la Steve Jobs, and played this teaser trailer for Fable. Did so they this is really just that? to whet your appetite. Yeah. They actually said one more thing. Yeah. Nobody, you nobody in any releases should be allowed to say that anymore. Why not? It's not trademarked. I yeah. know, but that was his thing. That's ridiculous. So he's other, plenty of other people have done it besides Steve Jobs. Yeah. Well, he, it it's, became his thing, though. It's just like, it, did you not see Sleepless in Seattle? Just around the corner is not trademarked. I'm not one more thing is not Seattle. Oh Where's Seattle? <sighs> Emerald City. Emerald. What? Not sure. Not following. Never mind. <laughs> what do you got next, Chris? Another game, if you're a big RPG fan, is Avowed. It's by Obsidian, which is a studio that Microsoft also acquired. It's a large-scale role-playing game they showed off during the event. It's a dark game that features skeleton enemies in a first-person perspective. It's supposed to allow you to make use of magic and melee weapons. No release date was given, but they did promise to be, quote, expansive and that it was being built from the ground up to take advantage of Xbox Series X. So my guess here, probably not going to work on the Xbox One line of consoles when it comes out. My guess is this is probably not actually coming until 2023, 2024, or something like that, because it looked pretty early on. But if you are a uh, role-playing game fan, this looks like it could be pretty cool. And Obsidian, they've done some pretty good games. Uh, next up, it would not be a Microsoft launch event without there being a new Forza game coming out. Forza is the racing game that has become pretty famous for being a Microsoft product. Generally, it's fairly authentic as to how cars handle, and usually the graphics are gorgeous. Turn 10 Studios is an early development on its next Forza Motorsport title and showed off an in-engine trailer. As expected, it's going to have near photorealistic racing, which makes the use excuse me, which makes the most use out of Xbox Series X technology. And they spent a lot of time talking about how ray tracing would come into play to give you reflections and light glaring off of the road and other vehicles around you. It looked gorgeous. And the way they're actually taking cameras and like capturing vehicles and getting tons of photographs and 3D plots so that they can incorporate these vehicles into the game. If you are a racing game fan, I see no reason why the, this next Forza installment is not going to continue to build on everything that they've done before. Aren't we going to get a little bit tired, though, of tracing guys named Ray? <sighs> Next up, State of Decay 3. <laughs> this is another Microsoft exclusive that was showed off. Undead Labs premiered State of Decay 3. This is their next entry in their open-ended zombie survival series. Looks dark, and the teaser focused on a survivor scouting through the wilderness until she comes upon not an undead person, but an undead deer. So her, excuse me, State of Decay 2 just came out like a year and a half, two years ago. Pretty good game. The first one was pretty good. This is just continuing to build on a franchise that while it isn't huge, has really solid numbers and a pretty solid player base. So it just makes sense they would continue to put games out that are in this world. I think I should apologize uh, to Ray Skywalker. Uh, clearly, I I forgot her when I said guys named Ray. I Don't apologize. worry, most people forgot about Ray Skywalker now. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, Psycho. Wait a minute. Yes. Her name is not Ray Skywalker. <laughs> sure, it's not. You haven't watched the last movie, have you? Yeah, I did. It's not Skywalker. <laughs> keep going. Keep going. Look, Canon says she's Ray Skywalker now. <sighs> From a certain point of view. <laughs> I mean, she literally says her name is Ray Skywalker, so I guess 
that is my point of view. Is it, was it changed in the courts? If it wasn't legally changed, it was not Ray Skywalker. Possession is nine tenths of the law, my friend. She just took it and made it hers. <laughs> Look, I don't care for it either. I'm just saying this is canon now. Do you, do you know how many uh, famous people go by names that are they're not legally? Most actors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, a lot of them actually have to change their names. Exactly. Well. Legally. Le I don't Speaking of actors, though, <laughs> Jack Black <laughs> is going to be in Psychonauts, too. He'll be lending his golden pipes to do some voice work, singing in-game as well. He stars as the golden Navi-like wisp, but keeps his signature deep voice for the songs, according to the articles I'm reading here. This is just one of the new characters Roz will encounter in the Psychonauts 2 game, which had cut content returned back, excuse me, which had originally cut some content to try and get the game out, but after Microsoft acquired Double Fine Entertainment, they pushed the release date out so they could add in the content they were cutting out. The original Psychonauts game came out on the original Xbox, I think it was, around that time of uh, time frame. So this has been a big delay, but it's been a well-loved game that a lot of people have wanted a sequel for. So when it comes to console exclusives, this one's kind of a big deal, but the question is, has it been so long that a lot of people don't care anymore? So they've got to get a younger group interested in it versus the people that were 18, 19 when it came out going, oh my God, this is great. They'll probably still buy it when it comes out, but the younger generation may not care as much. Who knows? We'll look and see. It looks gorgeous. It looks like fun. Can I just say with Microsoft's track record of buying companies and doing products with them, uh, we can expect that this will not be a double fine. It will just be fine or adequate. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, next game that's coming out. This one you can actually play tomorrow. It'll hit Xbox Game Preview. This is Grounded. It's a game by Obsidian that was previously unveiled. So what is it? It's like if Honey, I Shrunk the Kids was turned into a game. This is a simulation game that will have you and your friends trying to survive in a backyard plagued by bugs that can eat you alive. You'll need to work together to survive, or you can betray your friends and survive on your own. The game hits Xbox Game Preview on July 28th, and it will be uh, smart delivery capable for the Series X when it comes out. It looks like a lot of fun in this trailer. It, in the fact that you can sort of either team up with your friends or then just betray them to save your own skin, I think could lead to some fun gameplay elements. More fun if you're playing with a group of friends you already know, if it's just a bunch of anonymous people. I don't think it would be near as difficult a decision to betray someone, but I still have Game Pass on my Xbox, so I'll probably check this out this upcoming weekend when I can get it for my, uh, when I have time to play it, rather. Um, so this is actually going to be on current gen Xbox? This will be on current and upgradable on the next gen. Okay. Um, can I just say, as the kid that was always picked last, this doesn't sound fun at all. <laughs> so uh two two other quick game stories to talk about in regards to this microsoft acquired obsidian entertainment we've talked about them a lot one of the games they had just recently dropped was the outer worlds during this event microsoft announced there is new dlc coming to the outer worlds in the form of a chapter called paralong gorgon which will add more danger and corporate intrigue to obsidian's role-playing game Slated to come out on September 9th. If you are a Game Pass subscriber, you don't have to buy the DLC. It is part of Game Pass. Outer Worlds also available on PS4 and Nintendo Switch. So I would assume the DLC also coming to those consoles as well. And if you're not familiar, Outer Worlds is like Fallout 4 set in space, where you have a spaceship that can fly between planets. If Fallout 4 was your jam, you should try the Outer Worlds because you'll probably love it. I'm more of a jelly guy. No, well, in that case, you may not love it as much. If, you, if you're more of a jelly guy, you should try this other game that is coming to Game Pass, Dragon Quest XI-S Definitive Edition. Now, why is this a big deal? Because the Definitive Edition up until uh, last week was only available on the Nintendo Switch, and the Dragon Quest Japanese RPG games are beloved across the world. They're fantastic, and it is the first time the Dragon Quest series has come to the Xbox platform. This includes all of the enhancements they did on the Switch version, allows you to bounce back and forth between uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional graphics, where they've cleaned up the music, cleaned up the voiceover. It will launch on December 4th. It will also be included in Xbox Game Pass. So you'll notice, as I've talked about everything here, all of these games Microsoft announced are either things they've acquired rights to or developed in-house, meaning they're going to be on Game Pass. Why is this important? Every game. Mentioned during the event, Xbox VP Phil Spencer emphasized 
will be available on Game Pass the day and date of its release. So if you're not familiar, Microsoft's Xbox Game Pass is a service that's very similar to Netflix. It allows a customer to download as many games as they want from an enormous collection for $9.99 per month. Now, Microsoft has committed that all Xbox first-party games coming out of Microsoft Studios will be on Game Pass day and date of release. Meaning instead of paying 60 bucks to buy a new game, you can just use your $10 a month uh, subscription and the day Halo Infinite launches, for instance, start playing it. Why is this a big deal? Well, in April, Game Pass surpassed 10 million subscribers. Now, let's make a comparison here. It's not exactly apples to apples, so it's more of an apples to oranges. But for some context here, Sony sold more than 4 million copies of The Last of Us Part Two in its debut weekend last month. That was its second biggest video game launch ever. Microsoft bringing in 10 million subscribers per month for people that subscribe to Game Pass. So we're starting to see potentially the model that Microsoft is looking at going forward. They're less concerned about the the large new exclusive release versus, hey, we're going to have this subscription service. And if we can put out three or four really solid games that you're interested in, you stay on board and you stay a subscriber to Game Pass for years at a time. Which I think I I like I like this. Um, I've made it clear that I like having discs around for um, movies and things like that. Um. On paper, I like having a physical copy, especially having seen games leave Game Pass and my kids get upset and things like that. But the thing is, I think all of us that have had consoles over multiple generations have a stack of games that we never play because they're Mm -hmm. on an old console, right? And I like this model because of the fact that there are some games that you buy and you play for a bit and then they, they go nowhere and you're just bored with them. And so... This is good because you're paying a license fee for it instead. And when you do end up not doing anything with it because you're bored, you're, you haven't put out the full cost of that game. So now I- you do, you'll run into the same problem you have on Netflix in some cases. Mm-hmm. Third party games that Microsoft doesn't own outright can potentially leave the service yeah. if they're no longer being licensed out. But Microsoft, like I have mentioned, has made a point that every studio they own, which includes almost every game, here from the Xbox game event will be on Game Pass the day it launches. They did it with Gears of War 5 when that dropped. That is what I think is the interesting thing in this Microsoft game event. Uh, Suncast in the chat room said, I got to be honest, even though I'm a non-gamer, I'm a tech nerd. I find myself not seeing why any of this Xbox hype is newsworthy. I sort of agree, but I agree to the extent of the console and the games potentially aren't necessarily the hype. The hype is the ecosystem they're building. Microsoft is building a gaming subscription model. Like we saw Google Stadia want to do it. We've seen other services want to do it with cloud-based gaming, which Microsoft is doing on top of the consoles that they're developing too. Microsoft is building a world that you can live in and consume as many or as few games as you want for what is arguably pretty decent price. Yeah, I, I have to say the price is pretty good when you look at the way that you can bundle it with. Um, what do they call it? Game Pass Ultimate, which is essentially Game Pass Plus uh, Xbox Gold, which anybody that and, ha- has Xbox that wants to play online needs to get gold. And Game Pass for PC, yes. which allows you to play these games when there's Windows versions of them on a PC, which will also Game Pass Ultimate in September. I think they said the Switch flips will include the xCloud version of uh, gaming, meaning you can play Xbox games that are streamed from Microsoft servers on your tablet or on your cell phone or on a laptop, presumably, things like that. So what Google Stadia is doing, Microsoft is doing with all of their Xbox games that's folded into the Game Pass subscription. It's a pretty interesting model. What's the Stadia you speak of? You've said it twice. (laughs) It's your favorite service, Stephen. (laughs) So I think the Game Pass, it becomes interesting because this gives you an opportunity to try games you may not necessarily have wanted to play. You could be looking through all of these games that were announced at the event and go, hmm, a few of these are ones I think I'd be interested in. Some of them I don't care about. Now you'll have the chance to try it because it's all part of your subscription model. And Microsoft has already had some pretty decent success with this because uh, there's a game they did through Rare, which is a studio they own, called Sea of Thieves, which is a pirate open world MMO kind of game that when it first launched kind of had mixed reviews, but they've put out multiple DLC packs as part of the uh, Game Pass and things like that. And Sea of Thieves has a huge player base now. There's lots of people playing it. There's tons of buzz about it. You see a lot of folks playing it online. So Microsoft has grown a community around a game that they're offering as part of their Game Pass subscription. And if I had to guess, I'm wagering most people probably didn't buy the game to begin with. 
they probably got it through Game Pass, and that's how people got interested in it. So we're seeing an interesting shift here to move Game Pass to the center of its business model. Microsoft's not necessarily trying to compete with Sony in the race to publish a couple of massive AAA blockbusters a year, but like I said, it's the Netflix model now. Maintain a steady drumbeat of new releases that keep your subscribers locked in. We all know Netflix doesn't always produce the best movies, but it doesn't really matter on a Friday night when you want to turn on the TV, crash on the couch, and watch something simple. Netflix is your go-to, and this is what Microsoft wants to do, is make Game Pass in their online world the place you go to. Get locked into the ecosystem, not necessarily the individual game. I think it's an interesting model. I'm curious to see where they go with it. And that's what this whole game event kind of devolved into in the end was hey, here's everything we have coming. All of these things are coming to Game Pass. Here's why you should subscribe to Game Pass. And you go, holy crap, with all these games they have slated to come direct to Game Pass, this is a pretty solid market, a pretty solid value. And I'm curious to see how their competition emulates or does something similar. Because remember, there's online services for both the Nintendo and the Sony PS4 slash PS5 when it comes out. And with the uh, PlayStation Network, you get, you get two free games a month, similar to what Microsoft does with the games with gold, but they don't have this subscription model that gives you access to hundreds of games per month. So long as you're a subscriber, that'll be interesting to see as this all develops, how do Sony and Nintendo pivot to try and sort of embrace this model or do they care? They just keep banking on the fact that, Hey, we've got some great exclusive first party games like the Mario series, the Spider-Man series, last of us, God of war, things like that. And maybe that's what they bank on to keep people locked into. I'm really curious to see how this develops. It's really intriguing to me. And yes, I know part of that is because I predominantly game on my Xbox. That's always been my primary console since the original system came out. So maybe I'm a little biased, but I'm really curious to see how things shape up and at the end of 2020 and on through the next few years here as they pivot towards more a subscription model to get people involved. You'll be a Stadia user in no time. Well, I mean, effectively, I'll be Microsoft's version of a Stadia user because I did use the xCloud beta, and that's about all I can really say about it is that I was a beta user because I don't remember what all the terms of the NDA were. (laughs) But there are all sorts of people that were. There's tons of articles out there, and it worked remarkably well on my Android phone. So I can see where the benefit would be. And there's a part of me that goes, you know, If I were a 16-year-old kid or a college student or something like that, I would like the ability between classes or something like that to whip out my cell phone, launch the NextCloud app, and start playing Halo Infinite on my cell phone with a Bluetooth controller connected to it and have pretty much the same experience I had on a console. That's kind of cool. I'm glad to hear that you can think about how you would whip it out in between classes and enjoy yourself. Thanks for uh, putting a dirty slant on that, Stephen. I appreciate it. I did not. It. I thought this mind. was a family. It was your I mind. Was f- I, I You're did. the one that took it dirty. I did not. I said uh-huh. words that are entirely line up with what you said. Mm-hmm. <laughs> See what you did there. I actually 100% agree with you. I think that I think that this is a very, very solid business plan for them. And I think there is a lot of people who would be willing to to get into this market just because of this model. I remember when games started going up and buy and they they cost a lot of money. And that was back when like $40 was a lot for games. And I remember the first time I had to buy one of those games, I was like, this is insane. This is crazy. How can I afford this? Right. And if back then I was given this option, well, you pay $40 or you can pay 10 bucks a month and you get a whole bunch more games, I would absolutely have done that. I mean, the trade-off you're always going to run into with Game Pass is these big third-party games that come out. So say like Watch yeah. Dog Legions that comes out in October. That's obviously not going to be on Game Pass anytime soon because it's a AAA game coming out. You've probably got like a year or two before they would potentially become part of Game Pass. But we've seen things like GTA 5 on there. We've seen things like Fallout 76, Fallout 4, other things like that. It's just you have to realize these big third-party games, if you want to be a Game Pass-only gamer, you're going to have to wait a bit of time to do that. It's not necessarily the end of the world if you have a large back catalog of games to play, though, which I do. (laughs) (laughs) SP, as the resident uh, Sony user here, I know that you're like huge on the Sony bandwagon. You're like, yeah, Sony gaming forever. Take that. Chris Farrell, you suck. Uh, What exactly? (laughs) 
<laughs> that's not true at all. Uh, what do you think of this? Let's see. Uh, BestBuy.com products, uh, video games, Xbox One, Xbox One consoles. Uh, let's see here. Oh, it, here's one Xbox One S, one terabyte, two ninety nine sold out. Uh, Xbox <laughs> One X, one terabyte, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order Deluxe Edition condo, console bun, three ninety nine sold out. Okay. Uh, here we go. Xbox One S, one terabyte, all digital edition console, no disc. So two forty nine ninety sold out. Okay. But see, you already own an Xbox, though. So I own several. I would like a four K capable Xbox, a true four K capable Wait, Xbox, which would be months. an Xbox One X. There is a perfect time with this announcement to sell some consoles, and there are none available. In Absolutely fact, they discontinued none. them. No, they didn't discontinue yes, the did. Xbox One Xbox S. Xbox One, okay, excuse me, Xbox One X and the Xbox One S Digital Edition are discontinued officially. I as get of like that, a week ago. but there are no Xbox consoles available for purchase right now. Pandemic none. life, man. Switch had the same problem for a long time, and they're finally able to be picked up as there's nintendo switches available now sometimes it, if you can time it right follow wario 64 on twitter every time they're in stock on like amazon best buy and tw and a few other places he's always tweeting i'm like here now is your chance so you can sometimes find them and you can sometimes find the ring fit game but <laughs> pandemic life guys makes it really hard to buy new consoles right now as an so fyi I, I can go to dell canada apparently and get a microsoft xbox one s 4K uh, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order version for 379 Canadian. S or X? S. <laughs> S. Yeah. Okay. So it's just synthetic 4K. So a couple but of things you were here. Just, you were just complaining about the Xbox One S being unavailable, so I had I had to. Oh, okay. That's fair. Okay. <laughs> He's just poking. Don't mind it. <laughs> so well, that's fine. I mean, he doesn't get CBS All Access up there, so which I'm hard about. What a loss. <laughs> you know, yeah, right. I was as crushed about that as I was uh, Peacock. I was about to make a peacock <laughs> joke too. You beat me to it. Actually, CBS All Access is technically available up here, but it's very stripped down because a bunch of other companies have the rights to all whoa, the CBS whoa, whoa, content. Whoa, whoa, Let's keep this family friendly. <laughs> You're not stripped down. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's just uh, less capable. Okay, so a couple <laughs> things here. I would love a new Xbox console, and it's just not going to come out right away. That is Halo specific. So, you know, the Halo bundle. So it makes all the Halo sounds and stuff like that. Would love one. Eventually, probably will get one. Probably not for Halo Infinite because it's coming out near release here, right? So I'll have to wait for the next one down the road in order to get that. So that's that's one. And two is we're going to see a revolution in how the games are played. Yes, I would like a version that has a disc in because i would like to play my 4k and my blu-ray discs in it but eventually that's all going to go away too and i i'm fine with the all digital as it comes out but you know with this uh, lack of availability i depending on the price of the consoles when they come out i don't know if i'm gonna go ahead and get one right away or not so we'll see but It'll be nice to play some of these games. I knew somebody that was so into Fable. He he was so into Fable 3, and he will absolutely love this new Fable game. Personally, I'll love Halo, and I played it with all the kids. We played Halo all the way through. I played it with each one of them. Now, am I an expert? No, I played it on the easy level, but I did play it all the way through, and I really enjoy the gameplay there. As far as Sony's announcement, though... It, it's the sign of 2020 and it's just too bad because I was all revving to actually buy a console when I was watching this and listening to all this stuff and it's just not going to be available. So mm. I got good news for you, by the way, I did a little Googling here and if you're willing oh, no. to drive 35 odd hours up north to uh, a town called Fort McMurray, apparently the EB games, which is the Canadian version of GameStop, uh, they apparently have in stock the Xbox One X uh, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. So just a small little... For how much? Uh, four seventy nine Canadian. So It's not too bad. It says I can it, get one on eBay, but I just don't want to do that. It says it's in stock. So if you want to go for a little bit of a drive... Uh, 
and oh. you can't order it online. No, it says that it's only available in store. So okay. you, you might get there and it might not even be there. So if yeah. you're someone like who's S- SP who's got that itch to want to get something sooner than later, I-, I would kind of push you to hold off because we still don't know price points on either the Series X, the PS4, excuse me, PS5. And there are still rumors that are starting to pick up steam that there could, for lack of a better term, be an Xbox One Series X that's a slightly lesser version that would still do like 4K movies and stuff like that, but maybe not necessarily be as fully featured as the Series X, but also at a lower price point. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. So there's still a lot to come out in regards to these consoles. I will be honest, I was really shocked that Microsoft discontinued the uh, the Xbox One X mm-hmm, this yeah. far out. My guess is it was more a matter of they looked at their supply chain and said by the time we could resupply and have us in a decent state, we'd probably be dropping the new Xbox. So what's the point in restarting it? And I also think that the Series X price point is probably something similar to what they're looking at. Excuse me. The Xbox One X price point <laughs> is probably similar to some or close to the Series X price point when it comes out. Because I honestly think that since Microsoft is pushing Game Pass is how they want to get people in there, they're probably going to try and undercut Sony's price on the PS5 this time around. I really do think that. Yeah, um, I'm really interested to see, too, if they end up uh, taking off with that, whatever it is where you pay a fee until it's paid off. That's They, they have been doing, yeah, and I, I think it's their all-access program you're talking about there, yeah. Stephen. And for those that aren't familiar, I wasn't really aware of it because Microsoft didn't advertise it a ton. But there was a program they ran where you could get a console, an Xbox Live Gold, and Xbox Live Game Pass subscription that you paid it all off per month. So in theory, you could have gotten an Xbox One X Game Pass and Gold and paid 99 bucks a month until the whole thing was paid off with no interest accrued to it, and then continued your Game Pass and Gold subscriptions. It's, it was interesting. And I believe they'll probably do something similar with the Series X. But the problem is, how well do they advertise it? Because I didn't know a ton about it until I saw stuff on a tech blog somewhere. I went, Microsoft's doing what? That's really cool. Yeah, I, I, I hope that that's the case. Uh, I really do. But that's going to go ahead and take us to the end of the show. Before we wrap up, I will let you guys plug and promote and do whatever you'd like to do. Let's start off with Chris Thunderclouds Feral. Oh, geez. I, I have no idea because I've been talking so much what to plug and promote. Uh, I'll go with my standby then is don't forget we're living pandemic life right now. You guys want some entertainment. You guys want some live entertainment. Well, the Gunna Geek Network's got some content for you. If you go to geeks.live, you can scroll down to the bottom of the page. There's a calendar of all of our upcoming live events. Please come check out some of our live content on the network and tell them that we sent you from the GunnaGeek.com show. Stargate Pioneer. When you're listening to this, when it's actually published, odds are I will have a new video out on the Better Podcasting YouTube channel, which you can find at youtube.com slash betterpodcasting, I hope. Or go to the betterpodcasting.com website and you will see a new gear video when I send it out. And if you go to our Discord server, eventually I might drop a behind the scenes of that too. You might not want to watch it, just warning you, but it'll be there. And I just want to take a moment and uh, plug and promote these two fine gentlemen. Uh, It's always a pleasure to podcast with you guys. And it's been a while since I've patted you two on the back on the show. And I just wanted to take a moment to do that because it's always a fun Monday. We record the show on Mondays and uh, Mondays can be terrible days. And I always enjoy having that terribleness end when we do the show because it is always a lot of fun. You thought I was going to be mean, didn't you? I wasn't. I'm, I was being I'm nice. waiting for their shoe to drop. <laughs> no, so I just wanted to say thank you guys for always making my Monday fun. But on that note, for episode 340 of the official GunnaGeek.com show, I'm Stephen John Drew saying I really hope that I don't get mad at Juan Foster. I really hope not. I'm SP saying I'm still looking forward to my Apple TV Generation 6. I'm Chris Farrell saying R.I.P. Mixer. We miss you. Not really. Bye. I do. <laughs> it was good. Some people it do. was good while it lasted, but it's all right. Just go over to Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Thanks for 
checking out another episode of the official gunnageek.com show. If you like the show, please give us a five-star review in Apple Podcasts or a thumbs up on YouTube. You can always join us for our live recording sessions, which stream Mondays at 8.45 p.m. Eastern at www.geeks.live. And remember, you can find our full back catalog at gunnageek.com forward slash show. If you're itching for more geeky content, check out other shows on gunnageeknetwork.com. Voice work was by Emily Prokop of the Story Behind podcast. That's it for this episode. We hope to see you back again next week. Don Trosser here with anything that's valid. Well, we will find out whether Don Cherry was right or not. <laughs> Let's go ahead and move on. Don Cherry. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how to start this segment now. <laughs> hey guys, I got a segment that has nothing to do with Don Cherry. I'm sorry. Hold on one sec. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Proctor! <laughs> Serenity now. Serenity so now. Good. You guys did so good with that. <laughs> All right.